Good morning to you, Calvin. Good morning, Julia. How um, fantastic was this report? Well, uh, this is the thing. The allegation is from the, I mean, from everybody, from Diane Abbott, uh, uh, David Lammy, the, the Shadow Justice Secretary now, and uh, and and pretty much everybody who, who seems to have commented on television and radio so far has been that this is a report that, well, it knew its conclusions before it started because it, none of the commissioners believe in systemic racism. So, of course, they didn't find it. And frankly, it is a whitewash. Do you agree? No, it's an interesting point, isn't it? Because there's been this conceived, uh, this perceived rather conception that every institution in this country is racist and that all racism is systemic in the UK. And that's kind of blinded us from looking at the real issues here. Like you said, this report has not been rhetoric. They've moved into evidence and they've looked at all of the disparities. And there are disparities in this country, but they're not necessarily racist just because they happen to have elements of race. So, for example, um, there are geographic problems, there are class problems, there are family structure problems that all all add up to improve or disadvantage people's lives. And if we really want everyone to have the best possible chance in the UK, we have to look at every aspect of their life and all of the socioeconomic factors that are playing into this situation rather than just saying, actually, it's all down to institutional racism, because it's not. There might be racism involved in the problem, but that's not the core of it. And that's not the underlying problem. And if we look at everything through these lenses of racial sensitivity, then we see racism everywhere. And it's not everywhere. And it's not institutionalised. And this report didn't find any evidence of institutionalised racism, but it did find lots of racism. I think, exactly. At no point was anyone saying, oh, everything's absolutely fine and you're all imagining it. There wasn't anything like that. And the vast majority of the members of this uh, uh, commission uh, were themselves from ethnic minority groups uh, and, and, um, you know, were were, were saying, you know, no point, they're saying there's no racism. People are still racist. The particularly particularly needs to tackle uh, racism online, racial abuse uh, online uh, uh, specifically. Um, but this is the thing, I think you hit the nail on the head there. When there is a racial disparity, we are always told instantly that's because of racism. Even with COVID, and I thought, good Lord, we've got a real problem to worry about. People will stop having the culture wars. It, really early on, because we did see the earlier deaths were of, of people working on the medical front line who were uh, largely uh, ethnic minorities, um, that it was seen somehow that this was some racial, well, there was racism behind this. There was some systemic racism and behind the fact that it was it was people who were ethnic minority who were dying, but there were really obvious explanations about this, which is that um, you know the large number of, of ethnic minority doctors and nurses working uh, at the front line in in urban areas, in particular in London. Huge, I mean, I think a third of the population of black people in this country does live in London, as opposed to spread out around the country. Um, yeah. Things things like in terms of uh, you know health disparities, in terms of of more likely to have diabetes, be overweight, be higher at risk, um, uh, poverty, people living in multi occupancy homes. I mean, there were so many things that were completely ignored in the face of oh but if it's a racial difference it must be down to racism and and not understanding that those are not the same thing exactly that so all this report does it is it looks deeper into the facts behind where the disparities come from so for example a lot of people keep saying at the moment um young black mothers or black mothers in general tend to die more during childbirth and that they assume that that is because the health system is racist. But actually, if you look deeper into the system, uh, most of the midwives are actually black themselves. And I wouldn't ever want to assume that most midwives are treating black mothers differently to white mothers. And actually, if we look at the stats and look at what's happening, there are different things at play. Likewise, if you flip it around, cancer patients who are Indian or Pakistani or Bangladeshi tend to have better survival rates than white cancer patients. That isn't to suggest that white cancer patients aren't being treated as well as Indian, Pakistani or Bangladeshi. So just because there's racial disparity does not mean it's racism. There are genetics, there are lifestyle choices, there are lots of things at play. Like you said about COVID, this multi-generational households is a massive difference between a lot of white British households and a lot of um, Indian British households, for example. Uh, And we have to look at the wider picture. And to me, that's what this report does. It moves away from the rhetoric, moves away from this divisive idea that everything is institutionally racist and looks at the core issues and says, how do we address these? How do we make society better for everyone? And if, like I've always said in my time in education, if you raise the standards for everyone, yep. that helps everyone. It don't take is. on, don't cherry pick communities. Well, we, I want to talk particularly about education because that is a crucial issue. And it was identified particularly as a crucial issue by the commission. Uh, but this report is 258 pages. One of the key things.
things that was picked up on in the newspapers today uh, against front page of the Times. Anger over slave claims in the landmark race review. Um, and uh, the, the race review is accused of being culturally deaf uh, because it stated that uh, there was a new story to be told about slavery, which wasn't just about profit and suffering, arguing that the era of our of our slave trade and particularly of, of, the, um, of the empire uh, was also about how culturally African people transformed themselves. Now, I have to say... I, the, this particular paragraph did jar a little bit for me, um, but the report proposed a making of modern Britain teaching resource to tell the multiple nuanced stories of the contributions made by different groups that have made this country the one it is today um, and said that the re recommendation was a response to negative calls for decolonizing the curriculum, um, bringing down statues, and we want all children to reclaim their British heritage. Now, talking positively about empire doesn't mean... You're saying, oh, slave trade was a good thing, does it? I mean, that's the thing. There is a nuanced conversation about, look, that was the past, that was history. There were different values in in every in every culture in every country uh, then than there were are today. But but that the the, the, the the empire may not necessarily have been one hundred percent a bad thing. There is that, but also I think this specifically was more about let's not paint black people as victims. Let's talk about African people and how they managed to preserve their humanity and their culture despite slavery. Let's talk about how they created a Caribbean people that created their own identity despite slavery. So it's all the positives around the issue, not that the issue itself was positive. But of course, if you want to discuss the empire, uh, we have to look at history holistically and say, yes, there were lots of atrocities, lots of bad things that happened under the empire, but also it helped spread Christianity, it helped spread hospitals, education, railways, uh, and lots of different things around the world. That, and parliamentary democracy is another one. So there are both pros and cons to every element of history. We have to teach it holistically. Otherwise, we're just painting a negative picture of ourselves that helps no one. And we want to unite everyone behind this British flag, not to say that, okay, you guys are slightly different because you're brown, so you had a harder time. Let's bring everyone back together. And I think what this report does is looks at how to do that. So, for example, in this country, we spend a lot of time looking at um, – pupils that aren't doing so well and trying to think why is it because they're black is it because they're this and that and what this report says is let's look at pupils that are doing really well and model that so chinese kids are doing really well in school indian kids are performing really high why is that and how can we model that and take that best practice to ensure all pupils are reaching those same levels and, That's and we, we, and we know and we know why a lot of that is and it's not all even all down, down to race and not even all down to income a lot of it's down to family structure isn't it it's a it's having you know two parents working often it's a, it's having a, a two parents in the home um it, it's a, it's a it's valuing education and this is the thing when you look at racism supposedly you know institutional racism in schools and the like indian kids doing so much better than pakistani or bangladeshi kids a children of african heritage doing so much better than children who are Afro-Caribbean heritage who, I mean, all I know is if we've got all this institutional racism, they're, they're incredibly good at, at, at picking out differences between people, uh, which most people perhaps wouldn't even be aware of. Um, and we know, again, that white working class kids are often at the bottom of the pile when it comes to uh, attainment at school and a chance of getting into university and uh, their job prospects and pay prospects in the future. So so that can't be down to race. It's it's almost obviously, obviously explained by educational opportunities, income, um, parental background, family unit, geography. Um, and, and as you say, these things affect everybody, regardless of the pigmentation of their skin or their religious background. You're right, it is obvious. But now we have a report that backs it up with lots of evidence that did lots of research and found other research externally and put it all together and shown us the, the bigger picture. That's what we needed, rather than just sit around shouting, institutional racism, this country is racist. But, but why do people want no to do that? It. Because it does, I mean, I very much felt when I saw the, a lot of the criticism, especially as most of mm. these people would not have had a chance to read the report, I thought it was a lot mm. of usual suspects. I mean, there is, there is, to all intents purposes, a race industry in this country, as there is in America. People whose livelihoods, whose reasons for being whose professional jobs basically rely on them telling everybody that the country is horrible and nasty and racist and they're part of the solution not part of the problem yeah these race hustlers commercially benefit from the uk being perceived as a racist country and we know it's not but they want they've got books to sell so they've got to keep telling us that it is and the more they peddle this myth the more people start to believe it and act in a racist way so it's self-perpetuating it doesn't help anyone it's actually detrimental to our way of life and we need to shut them down and hopefully that's what this report will help do calvin robinson conservative commentator senior fellow at policy exchange think tank thank you very much indeed for joining us quick word there from benjamin butterworth late editor of the i newspaper who's been joining us all this morning you and i talked to this about this at great extent but 
do you think there is an element where, uh, you know, OK, the accusation that the commissioners came at it from their point of view, but the people who are criticising it, they come from their point of view and you can show them data till you're blue in the face. They'll still believe that Britain is racist. I mean, I think it's wrong to try and suggest that all of the people who have taken a different rev uh, view to this report are are somehow, you know, doing it for the sake of, of making money. I think that's very unfair. And there are a lot of people, a lot of black people of and you know, other ethnic minorities, for that matter, of, of different politics, uh, who have raised concerns and have dedicated their lives to these issues and have found different problems and have worked in some of the institutions for which they raise concerns about, such as the police. And I think we, we do well not to just sort of swipe them to one side. You know, I spoke to the Muslim Council of Britain last night, which said that... Uh, that they had not been spoken to during this and that many uh, uh, ethnic minority Muslims in this country face uh, huge amounts of racism in different ways in their day-to-day -day lives and yet were totally ignored by the report. And they want the Prime Minister well, to explain why that happened. Well, the Muslim, Muslim Council of Britain is, is, is a self-appointed body. They don't necessarily... I mean, Muslims of Britain weren't asked to, uh, to vote them in as representative group, were they? So, I mean, but, they don't necessarily represent Muslims in this country as a whole. But they're the biggest Muslim body, representative Muslim body there is. And they said, uh, they said to me that this report uh, serves the interests of people who want to deny racism is a problem. Of course uh, they do. But I think that I think that that is a view that, that lots of ethnic minority people have expressed. And I think you do well to, to listen to why they're concerned by this and why they don't have trust in the report, because you know, if, if so many of them are not happy with it and don't think it represents their experience and what they found in their own work, I think that's a valid criticism oh, of the report. No, report. absolutely no. I think people talking from their personal experience, because they lived it, lived experience. I absolutely accept that. Again, it's just when you look at the actual data, is it not worth someone actually looking at the actual data and seeing what is the overall experience and whether or not people's individual experiences are representative of what is really going on out there? But, you know, the people who perhaps are talking more loudly online.